Okay, so here is the tractor that we're going to be building. Can you tell us a little bit about this kit? Sure. The, um, the actual genesis for this came from a, actually a photograph from World War II which showed, it was a single black and white photograph that showed this tractor, which is obviously a conversion of a Russian tractor, but it was been captured by the Germans, and they had done whatever they'd done to it to do, we assume, some sort of road work. Um, right. And it really captured my attention because it's it's an interesting subject, um, and it allowed me to kind of stretch the boundaries of just normal model building. It incorporated a lot of different aspects, a little bit of scratch building, a little bit of resin casting, a little bit of conversion, um, and of course you could do a highly weathered finish on this, and that was very interesting for me to, to attempt. Can you show us and point out what belongs to the kit and what you've actually added to this kit? Sure. So what you see in basically in green is the trumpeter uh, Russian S65 tractor. It's a nice little kit. It's a plastic injection molded kit like you'd buy off the shelf from your hobby store or mail order. When you buy this kit, there's no roof and there's no engine in it. It comes with side louver panels that go there to cover up that what would be an empty space. And if you look at these types of tractors, almost every one of them had those grills off. The, these tractors tended to overheat so they needed as much ventilation as possible. So it became important to put an engine inside of this thing. Uh, luckily for, for us, model builders, a fellow um, came up with a resin conversion. Who He scratch built his parts and then cast resin parts and made a resin conversion, basically. So I've included that resin conversion into this kit, which is purchased as a what they call an aftermarket product. Then, to make this thing to particularly unique to the photograph, the photograph showed it with a roof, and it showed us with this boom, and these are T-34 captured Russian tank wheels that they've somehow jerry-rigged across the front there. Of course, there's no kit for any of that, and so that will all be scratch-built from using plastic strip and, and bits and pieces of other you know string and whatever we have there in order to get those shapes that we need. Then the, the wheels themselves are resin casting that I did my, my own work on those where I used somebody else's wheel and just made multiple copies of it right. and, and added them into this as well. So what you see here is basically the, the box for the basic the base kit, the trumpeter, tractor, the, the injection molded part. And it's a very nice kit, not terribly complicated to put together, um, detailed well. It's a very nice kit for most levels of modelers. And then of course inside, as most kits do, it comes with your instructions, and in the, which are just a number of diagrams that take you from the beginning sequence all the way through the build. Then of course inside the kit, now I've been in the kit a little bit and did a little bit of pre-work on this so it's not exactly pristine yet but most kits come in this manner here where you're, these are called sprues and on that are laid out all the different parts. How long would something like this, just the basic kit itself, take to construct? That's, that's kind of an interesting question. This kit would probably take a person three days maybe, so let's call it 16 hours. It's, it's a fairly simple, fairly easy kit to, to do. It's not, not a lot of complicated parts to it. I say that little hesitancy because it comes with these amazing tracks. Now these tracks, you can see I've already pre-built some of these for the essence of time and we'll, we'll go through how to build these a little bit later, but they just take time. The tracks themselves may take you another two days to put them together. Oh, right. just In addition to the three days? Yeah, wow. they're just a little bit fiddly. Okay. They're not hard, it just takes some time. So, you know, if you if you can devote yourself to this kit, you could definitely get it done in a week, um, no problem at all, um, just consistently working through it. And as I said, it's not complicated, it goes together very well, there's not any surprises, so it's a very good, it's a very good kit for most intermediate to even beginner modelers to, to start with. Okay, and then of course you decided to make it even more difficult by adding other stuff. So sure. what are the other things that you... This particular manufacturer decided to not put an engine into the engine compartment there. So the panels are there actually to hide an open blank space. And in this case, a company called LZ Models came out with the engine for this tractor. So he went out, did the research, took the measurements on some of the surviving specimens that they have, and came out with resin parts for these. What I've done is gone ahead and ordered his aftermarket kit of the resin pieces. An example of some of the pieces come are like this. These are somewhat jumbled up now because I've gone through the, the bag itself, but I'll, I'll dump these out and get an idea of what they come right like. 
It's a lot of little pieces. So as you see, it comes in a bag like this, and, and in the kit itself, there's probably maybe 75 to 100 parts, individual parts. Just to make the engine. Just wow. to make the engine. Incredible. Um, I've taken the liberty, and I'll show it to you right now, of doing a little bit of pre pre-work on this engine. So maybe about a third of the engine is of the parts been made to make it to this point. And once we work on the trumpeter kit, the styrene part of it, at some point we'll drop this into the engine so it'll allow us to keep those side panels off and have the engine inside. Also with this kit, the, the aftermarket kit, we have a little bit of photo etch. And photo etch is a really marvelous little tool. This is brass, very thin. Mm -hmm. And um, it's done through a photo process which basically burns parts of it away. And what we were able to do with this is that like LZ Models has given us a new grill for the front of this so we actually have a real live grill, not just texture onto plastic, but we have a grill, we right. have a real fan, and we have some of these other parts that are more in scale, uh, scale thickness by using thin pieces of metal than the plastic can't get very thin, right. otherwise it gets brittle and breaks. So we can make certain things out of metal. So we'll, we'll get into the, how to do that in a little bit. And just for reference, real quick, pardon my reach, this is... Uh, the, CD. DVD, the CD that comes for the instructions. So all these different parts were laid out and I was able just to rather than going back to the beginning of the, the CD every time to find what the parts number was I just printed this part of it out so I could have this by my desk and when it on my computer when it says A12 for instance I could see oh that part looks like that and somehow find it in this mess. Yes, right. <laughs> wow. And how long would a, this engine take you to construct for example? Uh, this actually goes together very very well. This is a marvelous piece of one of the better re resin kits out there. And this will take you maybe two days, two days at, at most. It, right. it does go together very, very quickly. And how much does something like this cost, this aftermarket part? Uh, this is... And do you have to get a special order from somewhere, like I assume? Right. You, coming from Europe or something? Yeah. Well, his company it's, himself is based in Europe, so I ordered directly from him. Um, he's very quick, and you'll have it... I live in the United States, and I had it to my house from the order within two weeks. And I think the retail might be wrong here is around fifty dollars for this. Um, the original kit, the trumpeter kit, is also about fifty dollars. This is the engine that goes into that compartment, and then this is the f large front radiator. The kit comes with the front radiator, but we're going to replace the kit's radiator with the one that he provided because it's ma it's made to go with this photo this etch that goes in with it later. Right. So we'll we'll take advantage of that detailing. Okay. So the very last component, if you remember from the original, when we talked about the model as we start, was that large boom at the front of it where it held onto the, those wheels and then the, the uh, roof that was over the cab. And those were all, in the original photograph, of course, there's no aftermarket parts. It's, that's a very unique vehicle. That's the only one that was ever built like that. So what we'll do a little bit later is scratch build these things. Mm -hmm. I, I know from my own experience when I first heard about people scratch building I thought oh that's a big thing I'm never gonna be able to do it that's what the gods of modeling do right it's really actually a very simple and rewarding process it's if you can you, you have a head start because there's a lot of companies out there this happens to be the company called Evergreen very popular very easy to get a hold of they make all sorts of shapes and sizes and thicknesses of plastic strip and, and it's made out of styrene this is basically plastic, the same type of plastic almost that the kit itself was made out of. It comes in white, you can paint it up, you can cut it up, we can do all sorts of things to it. And from these, just making shapes and sizes, we can grow anything we want. And scratch, and this, that's what the scratch building process is. And we'll get into that a little bit on those certain items on the, on the tractor. And I think you'll see that it's a much simpler, much more straightforward process than maybe you're fearful of, of trying to tackle at this point. It, it kind of complicates the build a little bit because you kind of got to go back and forth for a little while. If you just do a, a kit out of the box, of course, you just follow the instructions from one to the end, and, and it's a, more of a linear process. When you start adding aftermarket or scratch building, you kind of have to think ahead a little bit and plan your model building sequences a little bit more. Um, there are certain things, like I say, in the kit we can't add yet until the engine gets put in there, so we'll get the engine up to speed pretty quickly so that when we get to that point in the kit we can just drop it in there. So let's go ahead and start with uh, the kit and building it. Okay. When I know that I can kind of jump ahead a little bit and kind of get motivated and get myself going, I'll 
do that. And in this case, I knew the trucks were going to take some time, so I wanted to go ahead and get those out of the way first. And I was able to do that, especially because these are workable trucks, as I mentioned, that are flexible and they click together. So they'll be able to install easily onto the tractor when I get to that point. And it happens in the instructions on step seven. Like I said, we just jumped ahead a little bit. I'm going to take care of those right now. That's where that little bit of experience might come into play, where you feel comfortable jumping ahead, getting something out of the way, even though it's out of sequence. In particular, we want to pay attention to this little diagram right here, which shows our track and how the, each individual link is assembled. And what we see is that it calls out for two pieces, a right and a left piece, number two, number three, and then the track plate on the bottom. So each track is going to have, or each tread I should say, is going to have these three pieces involved. So at this point, it's easy to go ahead and take those off of our sprue. We're going to want to flip this over, and the reason being, if we push down right here, we're putting a lot of stress. You can see how it's kind of bending and folding. Right. We don't want to break this part because these little tabs here want to keep it up, and it's lifted off the ground right here. If we flip this over, now we can cut against the solid surface and see how it's not warping the part now. Right. So in this case, we can just click it off and separate it from the sprue. So when we look at this piece right here, we can see that there's extra stuff on here. We call it flash or whatever. Just It needs to be cleaned up. These are gates, actually, these little things right here. And it's part of the injection molding process, and all parts will have these gates on that. Because basically the process of injection molding is you have your molds, liquid plastic gets pushed in through the molds in very high pressure, but it has to go someplace else beyond the part. It has to have a release, and that's what these are. They're built into this to allow the part itself to have full coverage and the excess come off to the sides. But we have to remove these gates. So we'll just simply follow the line, the contour of the part itself, and click them off. Oh, that's extra, okay. So that's the uh, little okay. extra part. So if you have any question, like if you, oh, does that part belong with that piece or not, you can generally go back to the instructions. And here's the number two that we've, we're working on. And now we're making it look closer. Remember those gates were just hanging off the bottom right here. So we've cut those off. So now it looks nice and tidy like this one does. But you can see it's still raggedy right there. It looks like we've cut a piece of plastic off. So this is the part about cleaning up that we have to do. And this is really why the tracks took so long, because you've got to cut all these parts out, but then you have to clean them up as well. Then you have to assemble them. So the thing you do about cleaning up parts is basically it's a sanding process for the most part. And for that, I use these sanding sticks. And they have different size, different uh, textures on you know on each quarter panel basically you've got a softer to the this is disinfectable which I don't know what that means <laughs> get that out of there anyway the different basically different grades of sanding paper on these things and you can choose the one that's appropriate for the type of cleanup that you're doing so we're going to focus on that little piece right there again there's one on each side we're just going to rough or easily sand this away now I'm not pushing hard I'm just getting in there and we're just going to kind of buff it back you see it's coming out and then I'm gonna I, what I did is I flipped this from a rougher grit to now a softer grit on this side and it's going to kind of polish that off and let's brush it off and now that parts cleaned up right now and we're you gonna, have to do that to obviously every single yeah and we, if we remember we cut that same piece off the other corner so we'll have to take care of the other corner and then we also if you remember we had the sprue attachment point right up here on top where we took it off the sprue itself, so we'll do that. And that was just a flat across the top like that. So we'll do that for eight. Now there's not a problem that it looks a little bit dusty or rough. Not a problem at this stage, and especially for these parts. Um, a lot of that's what you're seeing is this dust. Probably could probably push some of this dust off a little bit. Right. Clean it up a little bit so it's not quite as rough. This little bit of chatter you see right there, this, you can see actually this, the grit of the sandpaper coming across it. If depending on where you're doing your sanding, your cleanup, you do or don't have to be careful of this. This is going to be on the tracks. So it's going to be covered with mud. I know that. I know the finish I'm going to do. So it's not so important there. If you're doing on an exposed area, mm -hmm. like on a hood of a car or something like that, and you had to do some sort of sanding, then you want to be very mindful of that. You bring this back to just a glassy, uh, you know, right. smooth appearance. And that, in that regard, you would go into the, say, the thousands, the 1,500, and the 2,000 grit sandpaper, almost just like a paper towel on these things to get them polished back up. And keep in mind that this part here is probably, what, a centimeter and a half? 
yeah. across. So it's being magnified like crazy right now. So to the naked eye, you can't even see this. So, okay, so we've taken a moment here to clean up a few of these lengths of track. And what you could see here is that basically I've got my TR2s right down this side, my TR3s down this side as we reference them here and here, and my TR1 down the center here. And I've done a little sanding and cleaning up like we just talked about and showed in the last little segment. And so at this point, it's just a matter of gluing these three pieces together, these three pieces together, and so on, until you have a length, until you have all those, you know, completed. Okay, so you, glue, you super glue them? No, I'll use, actually, I'll show that. I use a, a, a thin cement, like this. Right. Now, the, the benefit of using these thin type cements like this, this one happens to be by Tamiya, there's Model Master makes some, there's a, various other brands. One, they, they flow very easily, they're very thin, you can apply them with a little brush which comes included in the bottle. But these types of cements are made to actually melt the plastic. So it's, mm. you're getting a bond of melted plastic, you know, you're not just gluing two things together, you're actually combining the right. two parts together right. for an incredibly strong hold. That's the good news. The bad news is if you make a mistake and have to pull it apart, you're probably going to end up with a little difficulty. That's why you actually have it laid out like this so you don't make that mistake. Right. If you've got more than two or three pieces working in tandem, you really want to dry fit those together just to make sure you know what you're doing so you don't end up with a little bit of a mistake they have to repair. Right. So now, now that took us about 10 minutes to do those. It, it does take a good good chunk of time. When I say two days, you know, that's like two evenings. That's Maybe it's eight hours altogether. Right. Okay, so, so let's take a look and see how you actually put these together. Okay, mm -hmm. so I've got our part here ready to assemble, and we're just going to do this one piece at a time. And so what we're going to first do is take our liquid cement, and these are the glue points right here, these little tiny little points right there. So I'm just going to put a little bit of glue on those sections right there. And then I know that they go into those two holes right there. And we just want to make sure that those are kind of sitting upright. And this type of glue actually puts a pretty good bond fairly quickly, so at this point right here, it's actually it's ready to go. I'm going to back up just slightly. I knew that this piece inserted into this piece, remember by the directions and the arrow going across. Right. So for me, it was important to consider that and put this piece on first, because I wanted this one to have a little bit of time to cure, so when I stuck this one into that hole, it didn't just pop this one off. Right. So I've got... I'm going to let this kind of sit here for about maybe about 30 seconds just to get that bond to, to kind of adhere a little bit, which I've done. So now I'm going to basically repeat the process, put a little bit of glue on those glue points. I don't need glue on this point right now anyway because it's going to go into this hole that you see here. Right. So this is a kind of a slide it in. You just slide this in. Let's see if I can do this where you can see it. I'm going to slide this into the hole there. Can you see it coming through? Right. And then I'm going to tap these down inside. Now this is glued down to those two little points down there and this pin has slid through the hole that was in this other side of the cleat here and through that point right there. And at this point I'll probably let it just dry like right now. Mm -hmm. So now we're back and I've got my four lengths finished here plus I've done a whole pile of extra ones here so we can build our tracks. At this point the glue is dried and that's kind of important that we have to have a little bit of time for the glue to dry so that these parts here don't want to pop off as we do this next step. And this is a pretty nice little system here, whereas this little pin that we stuck through here and this little little nub on this side here simply pop into the link in front of it. A little bit of force, not a lot, and there it goes. So it's not lining up right now, of course, because I'm on camera. <laughs> there it goes. So now they just link together. And we continue the process, and the instructions has told us that this is going to take 34 of these links together in order to make one side of track. So we're going to do this 34 times. Right. So we'll set that aside real quick, and you can see I've got extra ones here. And you can do it in small sections like this, you know, do three or four, put three or four together, and this thing just starts growing and growing and growing. Once we get done, I've got one side here, so this is 34 lengths right here. We've got our full workable track. It bends just like a real one does. And then you link it back. And we just link it back together at the end when we, when we have our wheels on. So now we're going to go back to the beginning of the instructions for the kit here. We've got the tracks out of the way. So now we're going to actually start building the 
tractor itself and it, as in most models it kind of works from the ground up where you do the tracks and the wheels and the chassis first and you build the frame and the top upper components later on this kit's no different first step we're doing here is basically creating a bunch of the little return rollers that go inside uh, the track housings there I've taken the liberty already of putting these together just for a little saving of time. The construction of these is fairly state straightforward, similar to what we did with the tracks, where we have two components on the side, in this case A22 repeated on either side, and the A21 part in between, and we just simply glue the two parts together with the A21 in the middle. And on this side over here, you make a little bit different component, but it's the same principle, where you take your A23s, put them together on the top, and then click them into the little framework which we've done right there, the A20 or the A18 framework. It's a very simple little process. The only thing you need to make note of, and this happens quite a bit with these types of kits, it will say make 10, make 2, make 2, which means you're going to be making 10 of these little guys right here. And the reason for that is, as you'll see later on, we're using, like you actually see in this photograph here, 5 per side. So make 10 of them, 5 go on one side, the left side, 5 go on the right side. So that's why so we're getting basically all the wheels out of the way in one step in this case. I've taken the liberty of completing the left side already, and that's the finished component right there. Basically, this structure here is the result of these steps that you see through this process here. The, the wheels are added here, and then just sequentially through this process, left to right, top to bottom, we work our way through the process to the final part right there. We're going to flip the page, and we're going to do the exact same thing. We'll end up with the mirror image of this particular piece from the other side. I could very easily see some of the miniature painters out there looking at these components and going, wow, you know what, I could really use that in my base or diorama as something else, as not a tank part or not belonging to a tank, but use these components and make something else out of it. Well, as that's a good point. As a side note, the most famous example of that which is, we call it kit bashing, where we take a kit and just bash it up and make something else out of it, mm -hmm. um, is the Millennium of Falcon. Lucas right. Arts, that's all part of armor parts on it, and, and it's fun for us who are familiar with those pieces to see, oh, there's the hatch from a panther tank or a, oh, really? a you know, tiger tank, or you know, the different things that they've used, and they've repeated them over and over and made the Millennium Falcon out of it. So uh, that's a very common, especially when you move into the science fiction world and things like that, where you're using your imagination but you need to find found components that are you know rather than scratch building everything by yourself use found components speeds up the process interesting shapes and designs as you mentioned highly detailed and you put them together in new ways and you create something brand new that's right. never been seen before just looking at those rollers they look like lanterns and they would be perfectly in scale with the, the 32 millimeter scale miniatures that some of our guys most of our guys do so good okay so we'll go ahead and build the other side perfect in this case here We'll start right up here again, top left hand corner, and it's calling out for the F13 and the F8 parts. And the easy way to do that is each of the sprues always has a number or a letter in this case. The F is sitting right here, and then you just look, you can do it by two ways. You try to identify by shape and size, which this obviously looks like those parts right here and here, and then you confirm it by looking at the number. And this one says 8, and this one says 13 here, which corresponds with those two numbers. So at this point we can cut them off. When we worked on the tracks, we talked about cutting in this manner, which is perfectly acceptable. And it comes off and then of course you have this little bit of clean up here on the top corner here that where we just cut it from that we're going to want to take care of in a mo few moments. The other way of doing this is if you get yourself some little pliers mm -hmm. and you and you just snip them off this way. Little trick on the pliers, you've got an open end and a closed side on this thing. Have the open side towards the part because that keeps the stress away from the part and it pushes the part away from, from it so you don't end up breaking a fragile piece. So I just want to keep that in mind. So then we just move this off to the side and then we start with the cleanup on these things again. So the bigger pieces like this, we're you're going to want to cut those off versus going straight to sanding. It just works much better. But once we get it to that level of, of we can just, that was a little bit too aggressive. And just do that. And I can feel it with my finger that it's nice and polished. So 
So there you go. Those are the two parts. One other thing I just noticed on this side here, but it's not going to pay. You're not going to bother us in this particular instance. Right. Besides, to uh, yeah. mention that, yeah. These are sink marks, and this is again part of the injection molding process. If we go to the finished piece, we can see that that sink mark itself is going to be inside here someplace where we'll never ever see it. Right. So you don't need to. Worry. So we don't need to worry about it in this case. It's not a bad idea. You can see there's a little bit of it just kind of cut it back just a little bit just to fade it out a little bit and it kind of almost disappears if they're real aggressive if the sink mark is very deep it may take a little bit of putty filler fill it up let it dry sand it back just get it back to level right. but like I said this case it's not going to really bother us so I'm not going to take a lot of time on that if you see here we've got our parts back together you know in this manner and see that those are the two parts we need left and right and then we could see that the next step in this process, now that we got these two parts cleaned up, is to add the wheels in the middle. If you remember, we'd already put those wheels together in the prior step when we were making 10 of these things. And you can see they've conveniently given us these little locator holes here like that. And you can just set them in here. Um, again, we can glue these. I'm not positive you'd actually have to glue these. Or if you wanted to, you can glue the... Because these are pinched together to some degree. Right. If we want to, we can get kind of tricky. What I've done is I put a little bit of glue on the interior sides here. Mm -hmm. So we'll fix those. Those will stay put. Mm -hmm. But we'll go ahead and and we'll we'll go ahead and just leave these free free wheeling. So if we want to, we can spin them later around. That might help us with our painting. Because we're gonna want to get in there with a little bit of paint because even though they're down there buried hidden, right. if you get it at the right level, you can see them. We're gonna we're gonna use that spinning motion to our advantage so we can get in there and actually spin those around once they're in place um, to reach with the paintbrush a little easier. So if you remember this wheel and this wheel I put glue on the bottoms so I'm going to use do the same thing and put corresponding glue on these two particular parts here. Once I put these together this will hold together but these actually are not glued on they're just held on by the pins. Right, it's only the central two. Central two. Right. Which I know for a fact that those will never get seen, so the painting isn't so important on those. So what I've done is, remember, I've got glue here, 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 and I'm kind of just slightly pinching these together. So that glue will set, and these will be permanently attached, but these will still be able to spin around. So that if you need to get in there and paint them, you can turn them around can, and paint them. Exactly. Right. So that part's finished. Okay. And it looks just like that, and then we can move on to this next section right here. I'm going to point out this particular piece in, in, right here. Mm -hmm. This is a very thin, delicate piece here held on to by this big fat gate here. Well, we have to separate these parts right here, but we're going to need to be very careful because if we just come in hard and push down on this, basically the force of this, you can already see it kind of flexing this, it's going to bend that down and probably break it right across here. So we're going to do a couple of things to try to make sure that doesn't happen. First, we're going to start away from where this is. So we're going to relieve the pressure every place else except for there. So when we get to that part, it's just the only thing hanging on. There's nothing pushing tension against it. Again, we're going to use our clippers this time because these aren't very thick e here either. And so we want to be, still be careful. Again, the interior side against the model. So when I click this, I'm holding this part, this piece with my thumb and my finger bet between. And I'm holding that very rigid between. I'm actually squeezing that part because I want that to stay as flat as possible and give that support. Because that first cut is very critical. And you can see there's even just the, the width of the tool itself is pushing this along. Yeah. And the pressure of doing that is a good chance you're going to bend or break that part. It's getting easier now because we've relieved some of that tension across here. So when this one wants to flex, it has some place to go. So once again, we're going to try to... And we're, I'm not trying to get close to the part necessarily. Right. You can see here that I've actually clicked the part and I've left that piece of clean up there because I'm not really, I can clean that up easier than I can fix a part. So I'll cut it back here closer to the sprue attachment itself and worry about cleaning up the part later on. Right. And then we're going to go up here to this last one. And again, this is kind of a tricky little part. I don't know if you could see this. It's difficult to tell where this part ends and the attachment part is. Right. So I can kind of see a faint line going horizontal right there. So I'm going to guess that that's where it is. But rather than trusting these, which I can't see very well, I'm going to go ahead and do this with my knife. I'm going to get a straight cut, push down, and cut across there. 
Now I've assured that I'm past the point where I know the part is, and I'll sand back to the attachment to the part part. So now I'm back to this one here that I was afraid of before, kind of the tricky one, but what I've done is, of course, relieve the pressure on every place around here. Oops, one right here to get. This one here is easy. It's going like that. So now the pressure's gone from everywhere. It's not in tight. And, I, and now I know that if I press down, I'm pressing hard on down here, I've got enough flexibility, but that's as far as it's going to be able to go right now. And I'm cutting away from that edge because I can clean up that edge better than I can fix that edge. So I'm just going to press down, making sure my blade is straight down, and a snap does it, and it's released. So now it's just a process of cleaning up. Again, this part here is a little tricky because it's nice and thin. You don't want to put a lot of pressure. So you're just going in even. I can see it's flexing already by doing this. Yeah. So I'm going to put my fingers real close to that point here, and this is why my fingers get cut up all the time. And I'm basically going to push it, and it's tapping my fingernails as I'm coming across. I'm just barely, barely, barely coming across it. You're taking it off layer by layer. Layer by layer, ever so easy. It's getting down to the point now where I can do it. The other key to the modeling is to make sure you have nice, sharp blades. Right. A dull blade will fight you, and you'll end up bending things and breaking things versus cutting things. So give yourself a box of X-Acto blades. Oh, Oops, see? There it goes, right there. So that was a... I need to figure out a different way to take this, to clean this off now. Because if I come back again and do the same thing, it's just going to want to bend this again, and we're going to end up breaking it. Right. And while I'm sitting here talking to you, I could see, well... This side's got a bunch of nubs on it, but this side is actually fairly flat if I lay it this way. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of that flatness, and I'm going to, again, I'm holding this down. I don't want it to move. I want to press it down already so there's no play, and I'm going to come in with a tip and just go straight down and get that off, and I'll sand that. But even sanding, I'm going to have yeah, to... There's a lot of back and forth motion. Yeah, I'm going to have to be particularly careful. And so we'll just take care of the other side at the same time while I'm doing this. Use the same method. And I position my index finger so that I can barely see air, or, you know, um, space above it. And I'm going to just sand basically against my finger and sand this down. So right now, you can see I'm, my, my, the part's not moving at all. It's just my sanding stick. And I'm actually polishing the side of my finger as well. <laughs> But that's, that's better than moving the part around and lose. Now that I've got it down a little bit, I can pull back a little bit on my fingers and get to that spot. And again, this is a little bit of a tricky spot because there's a bit of a contour in here, so I can't sand flat. I have to actually kind of dig in here slightly. Keep Again, my blade is fairly parallel with the surface. I'm just kind of almost scraping it. Matter of fact, I will scrape it in this case. And there it's gone. But now we have our part that's nice and cleaned up here now. Right. Again, you saw that there's some of these sinkholes in different places. They're in areas that we're not going to be able to see. I'm not going to worry about them. You know, here's a big one right there, but that's totally right. someplace we're not going to see. Okay, so our part's cleaned up. We've got our first section over here that we did just a moment ago. In the time that it's taken to clean this up, this is now nice and dry. It's glue. It's durable. We can play with it again. And this is where the dry fit is. So without glue, we're just going to put these things on here and see how this works. Is it a good fit? Is it a hard fit? Does it work? And it's a pretty good fit. This sits right down on there and those tabs go in there. What the dry fit also does, it tells me places that I'm going to need glue. So not only my tabs are going to need glue, but I can see that this piece, this little delicate piece, kind of runs along the top edge here. So that means I'm going to want to run some glue along the top edge of this bottom piece so this can fit down here and, and remain snug. Same thing as we go towards the front on either side. So at this point I'll just pop this back off and I'm going to grab my glue. Again it's got a small applicator paintbrush and I'm just going to kind of go across the top here. The thing about glue is a little goes a long ways. You can see I'm kind of using the side of my brush. I'm just kind of getting a wicking motion and it just kind of just kind of coating the top here. Again this type of glue dissolves the plastic you don't want a lot of it on there. You also don't want it running down the sides of your parts. Right. One of the things you can do to ruin a part or, is if this glue were to, let's pretend like the glue came down the side here. Mm -hmm. It will actually distort the plastic just to, without touching it because it's actually you know, changing the chemical compound. It's welding. It's, it's eating into it. But if you were to put your finger onto that, it's basically soft plastic and you're going to put your fingerprint into the plastic and it will stay there forever. So you really do want to have some care You've when you do. Before. Yes, I've done that before. You know, if a modeler says he hasn't done that before, then you know, go find another modeler. Yeah. 
So we're going to put this on top of here using these tabs, which I did it backwards. So I'm going to you know, test fit again. And then talking to you, I could tell that I, my, my, was dry. whoops, oh, look, like I just did that. Okay, there, can you see that? Yeah. That is a bit of glue coming down the edge there. First thing you want to do is, by habit, is wipe that off. Let's fix that mistake as fast as we can. Don't do that. Just let that sit there. If you do anything, if you can find a piece of paper towel. Uh, see, there's a bit of a drip down here. I'm not touching the thing itself. I'm just touching underneath it. I'm hoping that the paper towel wick it, wick some of that away. But you can see it's actually changed the surface yes, of, of yeah. that slightly. It's made a little bit of a texture contour. That's not a big deal right now because we're going to come back and we're going to primer over this. And primer, the reason, one of the reasons you use primer is to take care of those types of mistakes. If it's a big mistake, you can sand back mm -hmm. after the primer. You can sand back now, primer it, sand back again. It'll take care of any sort of surface imperfections. I know from experience that that's not going to cause me a problem down the road. The only thing I need to avoid at this point is putting my finger in that because at this moment, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. that plastic is in, is in fact soft. So it stays that way for a few minutes. Stays that way for a few minutes. But I'm going to go ahead and kind of motor on here. And what I did before that wasn't quite right is I I touched it with the top of my brush, mm -hmm. and that immediately unloaded the entire yeah, contents yeah. of the brush onto that piece of plastic. Right. By doing it this way, it kind of slows down the the application of the glues because this stuff is basically like water in its um, consistency but what I've got now I've got those tabs in there and what I'm kinda doing is just feeling to see if my glue is actually working or not and I can see here it's not, it's not right. yeah so rather than pull this all the way off and start again mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and use I'm gonna use the the corner that we have here between the, where these parts to actually allow this fluid to li wick, wick itself down here right. and um, to wick this I'm gonna pick a part a, a place where it's together already so I know that the bond will hit both of those and I'm just gonna and I, I don't know if you can see this but when I come across like this I'm actually pulling against the side of the let me pull this out I pull against the side of the bottle because I'm kind of unloading the brush right as I do this because I really don't want a lot, but I got enough on there that I know that if I go like this, I'm getting some glue into that corner right now. And I'm just going to kind of expand that out. And in this case, I'm kind of dropping the glue into that crack. And I know it's probably not picking up on the camera, but I could see where it is just by the glossy reflection of the you know glue sitting there, just basically like water. It won't soften the edge. Like you, you want to be careful not to get it on the edge. Yeah, I'm being very careful. I'm I'm actually getting into because there's there's a lip here. I'm getting under past the lip, and I'm right in this corner. I'm right between this space here. Now I've got glue in there now, and I don't know if you can see it, but when I squeeze, yeah, you can see it kind of yeah. pushing pushing the glue out of that space. Don't push too hard at this point because there's probably excess glue in there. Even though it didn't look like a, a put a lot in there, there's a, plenty of glue in there. So right now I'm just kind of tapping this down. As you saw in some of these parts, they start gluing fairly quickly. It starts holding. See, now this is all held through here. And now I'm just making sure I've got good contact across this whole area. Okay, so we'll let that uh, dry up and then we'll move on to the next part. So the next step in the page, almost following a downward motion in this case here, is you can see how they've got arrows here saying that we're going to go this direction then this direction. We're going to make these little side rails here, these little looped rails. And we've got one on this side, one on this side. They both have A16, the little loops in common, but they have a different runner board on the bottom here, D21 in this case and E11 on this case. We'll go ahead and focus on this one, this side right there. Okay, we've got my parts cleaned up here, my um, D21 and A16, the little loops in that little board. And I've got one on here just to kind of practice. You can see how they fit on there. And what we've got, it's very difficult to see, but you can see in this little trough right here, there's two little tiny indentation, two little locator points, which correspond to the bottom of these little guys right there. So you basically have to pick them up and stick them in there. This is a little bit, little bit small work. So I'm going to just go ahead and brush a little bit of the glue on there first, just to wet that area and let that thing start. And then I need to pick these little guys up, and that's very difficult to do. If you wet your finger, 
A lot of times you can get them onto the tip of your finger. And then I'm going to very carefully, without squeezing, put it in my tweezers. If you squeeze these things, that carpet monster guy is going to come get you again. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to lay that in there. Now, because I had pre moistened that with the glue, it's kind of tacky and sticky down there, but even that's not working. And you're going to see how sometimes this is a back and forth process. Lay that in there. And I think the glue dried, so I'm going to go ahead and reapply the glue. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do something that you probably shouldn't do. Yeah. Put an exacto blade in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you can moisten your blade and get it to stick to your blade and drop it down that way. Oops. You can see this is a tedious piece. Yeah, it's important that you guys get to see this though. This is, these, these are the little things that that are aggravating and take forever and they're very simple to sort of do but not when you actually comes time to actually doing them. There we go. Third time's the charm. There we go. So I'm gonna let that sit for just a second. I, I, I can see that it's not aligned properly but I'm gonna let that kind of set for just a second and then I'm gonna figure out how to scoot it around. And it's kind of just doing that. Kind of realign it. Right, and that's not going to be a structure or anything like that. There's no, nothing's going to be, you know, going through there. Or, no, not on this. I wouldn't think so. And I'll let those sit like that, and then I may come back and touch the bottoms of them later with a little bit of glue. I can see that this one's starting to lean over a little bit, and I'll just kind of tap it back up. Right. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do the other three, and then we'll come right back and show you what that looks like.